All right, now um, let's catch up to speed a little bit because we start off kind of in the middle of the story in chapter 4 here. Because it says, and as they spake unto the people. So what are they speaking about? Well, in chapter 3, last week we went through chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a story where Peter and John are walking into the temple and they see this man, he's impotent, he's, he's, he's lame from his feet, he can't walk. He's sitting there, he's asking for alms, he's asking for people to help him out, he's asking for money. They see him, you know, they say, look on us, you know, and they heal him. He, he rises up, he leaps up, and, and you know, he's healed from, from being lame in his feet. It's an amazing thing. And they're there, Peter starts preaching, and he starts rebuking the, the, the Jews for, you know, for giving up Jesus Christ to be, to be put to death and just saying that, look, it's not our power that did this. Jesus Christ is the reason why this man's whole standing here and leaping up and why this great miracle was done. It's not by us. So this is what happens when they're in the temple and all this stuff is going on. And this is where we catch up. It's getting up to speed in chapter 4. So in chapter 4, Peter's still preaching and he's teaching Jesus Christ to these people. And as he's you know, talking to them and preaching to them and stuff, the, uh, it says in verse 1, it says, The priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them. So, you know, the important people, the, the, the higher-ups, these officials came upon them. And, of course, the Sadducees, by the way, were the, the sect that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Um, just so you know, like, there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two major, like, sects of Judaism back then. And the Sadducees denied that a resurrection even would happen. So, of course, they're in there talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're trying to get people saved. So, of course, the Sadducees didn't like that. But then, you know, none of these other people liked it anyways. These are the same exact people that delivered up Jesus Christ to death. So they didn't like that. They arrest them. They're like, okay, we got to make this stop. You know, they're, they're causing a big uproar here. Obviously, I mean, people are already in an uproar because this guy just got, I mean, just got healed. Right? It's a, it's a huge miracle. The guy was like 40 years old. He's been, you know, a cripple since his mother, since birth. And now all of a sudden he's walking around and leaping and stuff. So they make a big commotion. They arrest him. And, um, you know, I really want to get in the story here to try to make it real because these guys were, were, were preaching the truth about Jesus Christ when this happened, right? And this is why. I mean, all, all of these events are happening because of the fact that they're boldly preaching Jesus Christ. They were so bold and they had the, the spirit upon them enough to even heal that man. And this is what all the commotion is about. And now they get confronted and even arrested by these officials and think about it, I mean, it says, you know, the, the chief, the, the, I'm sorry, the captain of the temple, so like, you know, the guy basically in charge of the temple, the priests and the Sadducees. These were all people that were supposedly, you know, like respected. They were officials. They were people in, in positions of authority, you know, people that were probably looked up to in the community. You know, they, they, were, they were important. This can be kind of intimidating, Right? I mean, when, when you're, you're preaching the gospel, you're out preaching about Jesus, and then all these people come up to you, and then they arrest you. And of course, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to intimidate him because they want him to shut up. They don't want him to talk. But um, then that's where we were in verse 3. It says, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even time. So it's, get, it's getting late in the evening, and they're like, okay, look, we got to stop this. We're just going to lay our hands on these people. We're going we're to physically, by force, take them. And we're going to put them in a hold. We're going to put them in, in a prison cell until the morning. Now, um, look at verse number four, because I don't want to read over. It's easy, to, it's easy to read over this stuff. Look at what verse four. It says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So as a result of their bold preaching, as a result of everything that's going on here, it says, you know, many of them which heard the word believed, 5,000 people, 5,000 people heard what they were preaching, what was going on, and they believed. 5,000 people got saved. That's 5,000 is a huge number of people. And that's something that's easy. When you're reading the Bible, you can just keep on going, you know, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, and, and you're just putting your time. But, but, but think about that. Let that sit, sit in that, that 5,000 people got saved. And, you know, the reason they even got saved is because two spirit-filled preachers decided to open up their mouths boldly and to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And they weren't intimidated by these people. You know, they, even, they went into this place. They knew that the, that the chief, you know, the priests were there, the Sadducees were there. It's in the temple. Of course they're going to be there. They know they're there, but they do it anyways. They preach anyways. They're commanded to preach. And they knew that they weren't going to like it. 
Yet they did it anyways because they had the boldness because they were filled with the Spirit. And, um, and they won a great victory for Christ. I mean, think about that. Praise God, 5,000 souls got saved as a result of them two going in there and everything that they did. That's a lot. That, that is huge right there. But let's continue on with this story. Look at verse number 5. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow, so they're, they're in hold all night, they're in jail, it says, that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So they even list off these names. I mean, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander. I mean, these were noteworthy men. And one of the reasons why they're noteworthy is these are the same exact people that, that put Jesus Christ to death. These are the same people that, that tried Jesus Christ, and they put him to death and, and, and delivered him up. And these are the same people now that, are, that, that John and Peter are coming before. And it says in verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name have you done this? So they're asking, look, and you want to talk about intimidating. I mean, you get these noteworthy men. And these are the people that literally, like, like Jesus Christ has not been dead for very long at this point and, and resurrected. But, you know, they're still that, that um, they know that, that these were the guys responsible for delivering up Jesus Christ. So there's, a, there's definitely a, a place here where an opportunity where, where, where Peter and John could just start backing down out of fear. Because if you think about it, like, I mean, they, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ and they put him to death. They could, they could be confronted with the same exact fate. They're teaching the same exact thing that Jesus was teaching. And they're teaching about Jesus Christ. And they're even saying that, you know, like, you guys delivered him up to death. And they're... And they're, they're going further and just kind of putting the blame on them, which is something they definitely don't want to hear. So now they get them. They've been sitting in jail all night, right? They're not having a good night, sitting in a cell. They had a great day. 5,000 people got saved. And it's very, I can only imagine it's got to be very tempting to just back down a little bit at this point. Not saying quit, but, you know, they could say, okay, well, you know, we're kind of in, in trouble here. Let's just back off a little bit, and um, you know we don't we don't want to die. We want to continue doing good work. And hey, we already got five thousand people saved. That's great, you know. Like, amen. Let's just let's just call it a day, and we've done good. But that's not what they do, and that's why I love I love this book so much. But look at verse number eight because they ask them. I mean, they're confronted by this, and this is. I mean, you got to get in the story because it can be very intimidating. I mean, imagine think about this. Imagine if you were. You're preaching the gospel, and you get arrested. You know the police come, they take you away, and then and and you know what? I don't know who the who the names are, the people in charge here, but let's say you know, like someone, some governor, and and you know people who are just in charge in the area, they come and they they all bring you before them, and it's just like you or you and your friend, and you're just standing just just in the midst, like right in the middle, like like they're like, okay, what are you doing? You know, and, and these are the same people that, that have just killed your friend, right? And now they're asking you. So it's not just, I mean, this isn't just like some, these regular, you know, officials that are, you know, they're pretty good people and they do good. No, these are the ones that delivered up Jesus Christ. They're asking him, they're confronted with that. But look at how Peter responds. I love this. Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined, of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. I love that response. He's got the bold. Don't, you know, again, don't read over this. It's, it's not a coincidence in verse 8. It says that Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. All throughout the Bible, you're going to find when people are filled with the Holy Ghost, they're preaching boldly. If you're not preaching, let me tell you this, if you get intimidated and people make you back down, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is going to give you that boldness that you need to preach the Word of Christ boldly. And we ought to pray for that boldness. And um, I, I love that response. I mean, he doesn't back down an inch. Actually, he goes a little bit farther. He says, oh, okay, you want to know about this? You want, to know, you want to know why this guy got healed? I'll tell you exactly why. He's like, I'm going to tell you and let all Israel know. It's by the name of Jesus Christ that this man, he said, 
whom ye have crucified. So again, he's pointing the finger again. And, and it doesn't get old. In chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, and in chapter 4, he's just, he's just laying it out saying, look, you crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to blame. And, he, and he's just, just not being quiet about it at all. He's letting them know, look, you did this. But God raised him from the dead. He was of God. He was the Son of God. God raised him from the dead. This is why... And, and, and here again, this is, there's another verse here too that, that um, as I was studying this chapter, this is great because um, you know, he lays into, the, into these Jews and these rulers about how they did that to Christ, but you can't, you can't get any bolder than what he was doing. I mean, just, just really laying into them. And look at verse number 11, because this, this is a very familiar verse. And it's important to keep in mind, these are the same people that, that put Christ to death. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now, that reference to Scripture, that's an Old Testament um, verse that was quoted. This was quoted more than one time in the New Testament. Look at uh, Luke chapter number 20 real quick. Turn back a few, few books to Luke. Look at chapter number 20, because here we see... Uh, Jesus Christ saying the same exact thing. Luke chapter number 20 and verse number 17. The Bible says, And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Again, the same scripture. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. This is Jesus Christ preaching. And look at verse number 19. It says, And the chief priests and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. So right then, like when he preached that verse, and that's the very next thing is saying, look, that's when they sought to lay hold on him. That's when they wanted to do something with him. Now they couldn't because, um, you know, because the people still were, you know, loved him, and they couldn't just take him at that point. That's why they take him with subtlety. But here we see that Peter, in his boldness, he uses the same exact verse. They had heard that already from Jesus Christ. He brings it up again. So there is no fear of man in Peter whatsoever at this point. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's preaching against him. And he's letting him know, look, this is what, you know, he was the chief cornerstone and you builders rejected him. <clears throat> look at verse number 12. Let's continue on here. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. This is a great soul winning verse. If you don't have this highlighted or underlined, I suggest doing that and using this when you go out soul winning. It's a great verse. Because the name of Jesus Christ is important. And I've gone over this in, a, in another sermon, but you know, it's not just a belief in a general God. It's not just believing on God in general that gets you saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Because there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, all that Je Jehovah's false witnesses want to talk about is, well, do you know what the name of God is? Do you know what the name of God is? And that's what they focus on. That's what they try to spread. You know, you're trying to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You knock on your door and say, look, can I show you how you can be saved? Can I show you this stuff? Look at what Jesus Christ did for you. And they're like, well, do you even know what the name of God is? Do you even know? And they just, they just really want to focus on this. Well, it's Jehovah. And for no other reason either. They have no reason to do that except just to say that like, well, uh, you don't even know what you're talking about because you don't even know the name of God. The name of God is Jehovah, and that's what we believe, and that's why we're Jehovah's Witnesses. And you know, it's it's just pride and arrogance and stupidity is what it is, because they're focusing on the wrong thing. They have no reason to even focus on that, except maybe to try you think make you think that you're just wrong or dumb or something. I don't know what the point is, but they're missing. You know, obviously they're missing this verse that says there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They're missing a host of other verses that that really magnify the name of Jesus Christ because it's his name that is the most important name that we need to know. That's the name whereby you get saved. I'm going to plow through some verses for you, but John 3.18 says, um, but he that, believe, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, a reference to his name. John 20.31 says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. 
Acts 2, 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 21 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 10, 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Philippians chapter 2, verses, verse 9 through 11 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The name of Jesus Christ is above every name. Verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus Christ is important. That's why, um, you know, there's a lot of people today, this ecumenical movement trying to blend all religions together and trying to tell you, well, it's all okay. I mean, basically, we all worship the same God. You do it a little bit different than I do it, whatever. And they'll try to even tell you that, well, you know, the Muslims, well, they, they believe in the same God, too. I mean, they believe in Abraham and Moses and Jesus, and they believe in these people. It's the same God. No, it's not the same God. The Muslims are not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. They're not believing in the name of Jesus Christ to go to heaven. They're not believing on that name. They have Muhammad, they have a false gospel. They have a gospel based on works. The name is important. People even say that the Jews have the same God. They'll say that, well, it's the God of the Old Testament. They just, you know, they don't believe in Jesus. Well, you know what? If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. They need to believe in that name. That name is going to give them remission of sins. That name is going to save them. They need to call on that name in order to be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. It's a great verse. It's a, it's a great verse to use, especially with some people who, who want to focus on names in the Bible. It's, you know, if you're... If you, if you, trying to convert a, a, a Jehovah's false witness, use, use this verse. This is a great verse. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So we're in Acts chapter 4. Let's continue on here. Look at verse number 13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, <laughs> There's so, many book, there's so many reasons why I love the book of Acts. And this chapter is just great. I'm loving it. I love the boldness of Peter. He doesn't back down. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They, you know, they heal this guy. I mean, they're doing great things for God. But then we see here, too, Peter and John were fishermen. I don't know if you remember. When Jesus was going around and, and gathering his disciples, they both, by trade, they were fishermen. That's what they did. They were regular people. They were average, blue-collar workers. They were fishermen. They were out in the boat. They worked with their hands. They worked, you know, night and day, and, and they were hard workers. They were regular guys. And here we see them preaching boldly and with authority, and people are listening to them. They're getting saved. They're doing a great work for God, and they're just regular guys, right? Now, the scribes and the rulers, these are the really educated people, and um, they're looking at them and saying, you know, these unlearned and ignorant men. And I'll tell you what. If you boldly proclaim that you believe the Bible is true, if you say, you know what, I believe that the Bible is true, everything in there is a fact, it's out of God's mouth, get ready to be called ignorant and unlearned by the world because it's going to happen a lot. That's like, like, oh, you believe the Bible? Yeah, you're ignorant. They go hand in hand. The world just thinks, if you believe this book, you are ignorant. And it happened, it happened back then, it happens today. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter how smart you are. It, doesn't, it, it makes no difference whatsoever. It doesn't even matter how much worldly knowledge you have. If you say that you believe this book and that this was written by God and that the words in this book are true, you're going to be called ignorant. I had this conversation just the other day. I was out soul winning. And um, I think it was on Sunday. I don't remember. You know, this guy, he was a Catholic. And I, you know, I was trying to give him the gospel. And I, and I was explaining how you could know for sure that you're saved because you have eternal life. And he was trying to say, well, no, no, no. And he used the argument that, like, well, yeah, I mean, people in hell have eternal life. And, and I try to say, no, they don't. It's just because they exist and they experience torture and torment and suffering doesn't mean they're alive. The Bible refers to them as being dead. And, you know, I try to explain it to him. But, but his big hang-up was this. He said, you know, well, I believe that, um, you know, the, the Bible is just a guideline. 
you know, there's a lot of stories in there, and it just kind of tells you how you should live your life. But you know, it's it's not it's, it wasn't based, it wasn't supposed to be a science book. It's not you know it's not based in fact like the way the way science is. So we had this this big like like he's just trusting in this man made science and just well science just proves you know like and he he tried to tell me you know, God gave us brains and you know of course we have these brains we're supposed to figure out you know what what's right and what's wrong and and he wouldn't have given us these brains if he didn't want us to do that. And obviously his biggest problem was he just didn't believe the word of God. And I told him that. I said, look, you just, you just don't believe God's word. You're just calling it a lie. And we went back to Genesis chapter 1. And, um, you know, he, one of the things that, that he was saying is, that, well, you got to understand, you know, these people, these people were real ignorant. They didn't know anything. And, and you know, God's just, you know, yeah, this is God's word. It's God's word. And he gave it to them. But it's, they're just, he's just trying to explain it in terms that they could understand. You know, because they would never be able to understand hydraulics. And they would never be able to understand, you know, oh, that there's these, you know, these gases came together and, you know, were formed and, the, you know, the density. And he's, you know, he's throwing out all these terms. Like, they would never be able to understand that. Yeah, because that's just so complicated that, you know, Adam would never be able to figure this out. He was just a bumbling idiot, just, just has no clue, right? Because that's how God created him. But, he, but he, he, you know, he wants to just think that, that this is just a storybook. And that, oh yeah, they just couldn't understand it. So I said this, I said, well look. And, and he tried to make it sound, he's like, well look, you know, my wife works with engineers and you know, she always has to tell them that, that they can't just write things for, for people that don't know anything about engineering to, to be able, and expect them to be able to understand what they're saying. They have to put it in a level. I said, okay, fine. Let's say God did that for us, but what they're saying is still has to be true. I mean, even if, even if you dumb it down and make it simpler to understand and you use a, a, an illustration or a story or an example of what you're trying to say, it still better be true. I said, if you, you can't use that example here. When God said on day one, he created the light, and then on day two, he created the sun, and then on day three, you know, like, and just go through. And you say, well, that's actually not the way it happened. It didn't even happen in that order. If you're saying it doesn't even happen in that order, you're calling the Bible, you're calling the book a lie, okay? Now, he didn't say exactly how he formed the sun. It's, I mean, it says that, that, that he spake it and, and, and it existed, basically. He spake it and it existed. Now, we don't understand all the details. We don't have to, which would go to his point, except it's still true what he told us. Otherwise, if it didn't happen this way, if you have the, uh, the, the sea creatures and the birds being created the same day and then the land animals coming, okay, either, either evolution theory is true, where, where we're coming out of the water and onto the land and then into the air, or it's not and the Bible's true, okay? The Bible, is, um, if, if you're trying to say that this evolutionary theory is true and correct, you have to be calling Genesis 1 a lie. And he didn't want to say that. He wasn't that bold to say that, but that's exactly what he believed in his heart. That's exactly what he was saying. And it was all because he was thinking, oh yeah, people back then, they're just so ignorant. And they just couldn't understand. And it's his pride. It's his prideful attitude thinking, well, we're so smart these days. And we've got everything fi figured out. That's why we live in this world of wickedness. And you have homos sleeping together and doing all kinds of other stuff. Because, yeah, we're so advanced and we got everything so figured out. And I started explaining, like, well, look, why do you figure out these, uh, you know, there's this pyramids and all these other great wonders that people today and all of our great wisdom and knowledge have no idea how they did that. And especially without machinery. Yeah, they had to have some intelligence. They had to understand what was going on. And it was insane. I tried, I tried talking to him. I probably spent a little bit too much time with him because, um, but anyways, he was... He had this whole argument that, you know, people are ignorant, and if you believe the Bible, basically you're ignorant too. And if you believe, oh, you believe that? You believe that's real? Like, literally, that's what, that's what happened? And that's what you're going to get. So just be, be prepared for it, and, and don't let it offend you. It's not that big of a deal. Like, you know, you're out there, like I was out there, and love trying to, trying to win this guy to Christ. And I was trying to persuade him, I was trying to convince him, but he wasn't having it. He, had, he, he just... He had his, his prideful attitude of, of being wrapped up in the knowledge and the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness with God. But look at the second part of that verse. In the same verse, 
It's saying that um, in verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. So even though they're, un they're unlearned and ignorant, they marveled. And I think this is a little bit more true to what the Bible's trying to teach us here is that, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So here you have these regular guys, these fishermen. Now, they weren't scholars. They weren't formally taught as the, the Pharisees were, as the scribes were, as the lawyers were, right? Yet here they are boldly preaching and, and, and having such a great impact and being persuasive, and they've got this truth coming out of their mouth. They marveled at that. They thought that was pretty amazing, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, if you're unlearned, if you're, un if you're ignorant, now first of all, you ought not to be. God doesn't want us to be stupid. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. God wants us to be smart. God wants us to be intelligent. God wants us to, to, to know things and have knowledge and wisdom. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all I get and get understanding. It says, but, but if you are, you know, if you are, if you don't have very much smarts, if you're not that smart, the best way to overcome that is to spend some time with Jesus. Now, these men, they were regular guys. They, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Spend some time with the Word of God. I guarantee you, if you spend enough time in this book and you're saved, you will get smarter. You will learn more. You will gain knowledge. You will gain wisdom. Spend a lot of time in the book of Proverbs, a book dedicated to wisdom and knowledge. God's truth and God's word is way more powerful than any textbook or anything else that you can learn in this world. And you will, your, your mind will start to work and, and, and understand things better the more that you read and understand and learn God's word. Because God's word has, has to do with every aspect of our life. And the more you can understand that and you can understand these principles and you can understand God's rules and his laws and everything else that he has for us, the more the world in general is going to make sense to you and you'll just be able to figure things out better and you'll become a smarter person. I believe that wholeheartedly. Let's continue reading here. Look at verse number 14. It says, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now look at this. Is, this blows me away. Because in verse number 14 it says that, you know, Beholding the man which was healed standing with them. So like this guy that was healed is standing there. They can say nothing against it. They can't say, oh, you guys didn't really heal, heal this guy. He's standing right there. I mean, in plain view of everyone. And they knew that it's a miracle. They knew it was a miracle. They're not, even, they're not even denying that. They know it was a miracle. They know it was a miraculous act. And they still had that hard, wicked heart. That hard, impenetrable, penetrable heart that they're just, they're not going to, they can't accept it. And they still just hate these guys. And that's why it says they commanded them to go aside. So they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, get out of here. we got to talk about this. They conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Because the first thing what they would like to do is deny it. That's what they would like to say. They'd like to say, hey, look. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't really do that. You know, that's just a rumor. That's just a lie. They'd like to deny it, but look, they can't. They said, everybody, it's been made known already to everyone that dwells in Jerusalem. Like, like this has gotten out. They can't control. They can't control the information getting out. But they're like, we, gotta, we still got to stop this. We can't let this news spread. So what do they do? They said, but that has spread no further among people. Let us certainly threaten them. And you know what? That's the same tactic that you're going to get today. Threats. You may be threatened, you might even get beat up, you might get thrown into jail, okay? But it's all just for, for threats, and they know that ultimately they can't stop you. They weren't able to stop Peter and John. All they had the power to do was to threaten them. You know, sometimes they're getting beat up, sometimes they're getting thrown in prison, but nothing can stop them. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If you're filled with the Spirit, and you're doing what's right... Don't let that stuff worry. Don't be intimidated by their threats because it's just a bunch of hot air. Just, all, their whole goal is just to get you to stop. 
And that's all they're trying to do. And if you let yourself get intimidated by that, then you're just going to let them win and you're going to be sinning against God by not preaching boldly what He wants you to preach. And if you have enough faith to, just, to preach God's Word boldly, then you ought to have enough faith to know that God can protect you. If God's going to let you go through some trials and tribulations, then He's going to let you go through it. But I'll tell you what's not going to help you. Closing your mouth and, and being scared and being intimidated by these people, that is not going to help. If God's already going to let you go through some, some hard times and trials by, by shutting your mouth and saying that way, that is not going to help you at all. That's just going to make things worse. So just continue to be strong. Have that faith and be bold. Now, look at what they do after this happens because they, um, you know, they're, they're threatened, they're charged. We'll keep reading here in verse number 18. It says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Okay, you guys can't teach about Jesus. You know, they, but they have nothing else they can do to him. It says, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. So he's saying, Look, if you think that we're going to listen to you more than we're going to listen to God, okay, you, you can judge that for yourself. He's saying, There's no way we're going to keep it quiet. And then he says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And as a good verse to keep in mind, you know, they have seen and heard all these things through Jesus Christ. They were with him, and that's why they're teaching all this stuff. They saw it, they heard it, they experienced it, and now they're going out and talking about it. But it's also an important reminder to, to remember the things that you um, surround yourself with, the communication, the, the, the people that talk, the speaking that you hear, um, and the, the people that, that you're around, it's going to rub off on you so that you won't be able to, to speak the things that you've, you've um, seen and heard. So what you put in front of your eyes, what you put into your ears, that stuff's going to come right back out of you. So, so, so be very, very, very careful with the things that you decide to sit in front of and to let come into your eyes and come into your ears. You have control over that. Okay, in many, many cases... When you're, if you're going to be listening to music, if you're going to be watching something on a television screen or on a computer or wherever you are, be careful because you cannot but speak the things which you've heard and seen. Now, hey, if you're, if you're enveloped in, in righteous things and things of God, you're seeing, you're reading the Bible, you're hearing preaching, you're doing good things, hey, you're going to speak and, and preach about that, just like, like Peter and John did. But be careful what you let come into your, into your brain and into your mind and into your heart. Because they'll come right back out again. Verse 21, it says, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which is done. So they're just like, look. It says, For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. This guy was over 40 years old. He got healed and everyone knew about it. And the people were, were glorifying God. I mean, 5,000 people got saved. I think they were on the side of, of Peter and John. These guys knew it. All they can do is just blow hot air. They can threaten them. Peter said, look, you know, you know we're going to go out and keep preaching this. We're not going to back down. So they threaten them some more, and then they let them go. Look at verse number 23, and it says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So they go back to the, to the rest of the disciples, the rest of the people, the rest of the church, and they say, look, this is everything that happened. It's kind of telling the whole story. They arrested us. And then it says in verse 24, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Now, real quick, when we talk to God, and you'll find us again over throughout Scripture, giving respect unto God's name, saying, you know, before they even ask anything, they're saying, God, you know, you're the creator of everything. The heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And they're just kind of, they're giving them respect. Every time they talk to God, they're, just, they're, they're going to them respect. They're not being real flippant about it, but let's see what they ask. Because they heard all this stuff that happened. Look at verse number 25. It says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. 
And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. So here they ask in verse 29, they're praying for boldness, saying, look, we just heard, we've just been threatened, you know, we know the Bible, we know that they say, you know, the heathen rage, and the rulers are gathered together against, against Jesus and against the name of Christ, and um, they're coming against us, we're experiencing this hard time, give us boldness. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy words. They're saying, look, we need boldness. We want to continue preaching this. We don't want to be intimidated. We don't want to back down. Please give us boldness. And it says, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And let's see what happens there. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. So again, we see here, it's an immediate answer to their prayer. They're, I mean, they're praying this. They just got back. All this stuff happened. And they're like, God, we need boldness. We need to continue, continue to preach about Jesus Christ. They just got done being threatened. They, they go pray to God for, for boldness. And he answers them immediately. I mean, right while they're praying here, it says, look, and then, you know, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they're assembled together. Everyone's there, the place just starts shaking. And then, boom, everybody's filled with the Holy Ghost. And notice again here, the same exact thing, just like with Peter earlier in the chapter. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. They were granted boldness when they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they, and they had the boldness to speak the word of God, nothing else. I mean, it was God's word that they needed boldness to speak. And that's what he gives them. If you want to be able to preach God's word boldly, you better get filled with the Holy Ghost. And one way to do that, a great way to do that, is to pray. Okay, pray about it. Ask God, beg God to give you the Holy Ghost so that, you know, when these trials come up, when people persecute you, when you're faced with people that, I mean, it doesn't matter who they are. It might not be a king or a ruler or a president or, or a governor or someone like that. It might just be someone like your parents or some other figure in your life that's always just been this, this person of authority that will, that will intimidate you. Maybe it's a boss, whoever, I don't know, whoever it may be. Someone who's had this, this authority and, and some reason where you might feel intimidated, pray to God for boldness so that you won't back down. If someone questions you on it, if someone calls you ignorant or whatever, that you're not just going to back down, but that you'll, you'll continue to preach God's word boldly. You have to have the Holy Spirit to do that. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit if you're out, say, for example, filling yourself out with other spirits? If you're out at the bar and, and drinking the wine and spirits and, and just filling yourself up with booze, do you think God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit? No, you're going after the wrong spirit. Or if you're going out and like fornicating or maybe committing some other major sin, do you think God's just going to be like, okay, I'm going to fill you with my spirit now? There's no way he's going to do that. He's looking for people who are, who are trying to serve him and want to do what's right. So, obviously, in order to preach God's word boldly, you're going to need to get sin out of your life. You're going to have to start living according to, to, to the way that God laid out for us to do. And pray for boldness. Commit yourself unto God. Commit yourself to reading the Bible and studying and knowing his word. And he will fill you with his spirit. He, want, he wants to use you. God wants to use you. God wants you to be used, you know, he wants you to be a vessel that's meat for the master's use. The Bible says, you know, you ought to keep your vessel clean and holy and, and able to be used by God. He wants to use you. He's looking for a lot of people to use these. He wants you to go out and do the work that he has set forth for you individually to go out and do. Make sure that you're ready for it. Make sure that you're keeping your vessel in honor and not in dishonor unto God. God wants to use you to bring glory unto his name. Let's continue on here in the chapter. We're almost done. Look at verse number 32. It says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, 
and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, this is the spirit that I pray for. I pray that we have that we'll have this spirit in our church and it'll continue and will thrive. Because being able to help people as they have need and and not being selfish or you know only worried about yourself, treating each other in the church as brothers and sisters, this is the spirit that we ought to have. We ought to have one spirit and one mind here and the fellowship to where you, you really care about other people and you're looking out for them. And if someone has need, man, you're going to do what, whatever is in your power to do to help somebody else out. I mean, this is what, this is what being a Christian is about. It's, it's, we should all be headed in the same direction for one as a church. So let's strive to have that unity of, of faith within this church. But you know, even more, it's, that's what being a Christian is about. That's what Jesus Christ gave us that great example of being a minister for us and, and, and laying down his life for others and, and doing things to help people out. I mean, he didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister. And that's what we are. We're supposed to be ministers for Christ. When you have a brother or sister in Christ and they have need, man, help that person out. And, and I'll tell you what, it's, it's going to, for one, it'll strengthen your relationship. If you don't know someone that well, a great way to get to know them. If you know they have a need, try to help them out. Man, reach out a helping hand. Do what you can do to help people out. And um, it'll help us all to be in one spirit and one mind and one body here as a church to do that for others. And, you know, uh, we were reading in, in James chapter 2 um, earlier, I think it was on Sunday, where, um, you know, if you basically if you say to someone, if someone comes to you, they're, they're cold and they're naked and they're hungry, you know, they're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, be, be clothed and be warm and, and, and you know, be filled. But you, like, don't do anything for them. And it has no profit whatsoever. Obviously, it doesn't profit that person at all. And that's why the Bible says, so, you know, faith without works is dead. We ought to have faith and, and continue so we can profit other people. We need to, to go out, take what you have, and give to others. I mean, if all you have is salvation, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, go out and give that to others. Give that knowledge to somebody else. There's lots of ways you can help people. Um, and, and keep in mind to pray for people, too. And you know if people have a, a certain need, you know that, that there's something going on in someone's life, pray for that person. And, um, you know, one other thing that I like to notice, and I haven't heard this very much, but, like, people try to point to this, this portion of Scripture to say, like, see, look, the Bible teaches communism. Because they'll say that, you know, it's a, and let's look at it real quick again. It says in verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Right? So they're saying, look, that's communism. Everything's common, and look, this isn't mine, it's not yours, there's no ownership, but we have all things common. It says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, great grace was upon them all. Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, there's a key, a very, very, very key difference here between communism and what's going on in this book, in this passage, because none of the people in this book are being forced to give up any of their stuff to just forcibly make some people equal by, by the threat of violence against them. That is not being done here at all, and that is exactly what communism is. It's using the government and the force of law to try to make everybody equal and say, well, you don't possess anything. This is not teaching that. Rather, what this is teaching is what I was just talking about. It's a spirit of family. When you have a family, you know, in our family, we, we give things for each other. Everything that we have in our family is common. You know, I don't have, well, this is, this is my Bible and that's your Bible. Or this is, you know, this is my computer. Or this is my couch. This is my chair. No, it's all common. Now, obviously, we have some things that, you know, that, that in a way they're ours, but they're, they're still all common. It's all here for the benefit of the family. This is stuff that's, that's ours. And this is the attitude that they had within the church. And the church is a family. It's brothers and sisters in Christ. So when they had all things common, I mean, people were like, hey, look, 
I've got all this stuff. I don't need this stuff. I'm going to sell it. Let's try to get together and make as much of an impact as we can. Let's support these guys who are going to go out and preach the gospel so that they don't have to work a job. We can help support them. Hey, look, I got this. I got a motorcycle. I could sell that. I can raise up some money here. Hey, let's give it to the church and let's see what we can do with this and let's make everything grow. Hey, here's a brother that, that has nothing and, and needs some help and needs a place to stay and needs some food. Look, let's give him some of the money we brought in. Then we brought in all this money together. Let's help him out. Let's help this person out. Let's help these people in need so that people don't have to lack. And that's what they're doing here. This isn't, just, this isn't communism. This is, this is people of their own will, of their own volition, bringing gifts and stuff to, to say, hey, look, let's put it together. Let, let's, let's make things happen. Let's make things work here. And it's, and it's a, like a, an attitude of a big family. And we'll finish off the chapter here where we leave off in the, uh, verse 36. And it says, And Joseph, who by the apostle was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here we see people, you know, this guy is even selling land. So they're raising a bunch of money. But if you think about it, I mean, there's a lot of people being added to the church. And there's a lot of people to care for. I mean, if there's, you know, 5,000 people got saved, I'm not saying they all just became part of the church, but there was, you know, these people are, are you know, the church is growing. They have widows to attend to. They're, they're, they're trying to support the apostles. And they're really just kind of getting things established still. This is a very, very early days and a lot of early growth and a lot of activity going on. And, um, and we see here a, a, a great, healthy attitude of, of being in unity in the faith and, and, and really caring about each other and looking out for each other. And, and it's exactly what we ought to have in this church. Now, I'm not saying we don't, but we're just getting started. Just, just make it a point. Make it a point to get to know when, when people come in, especially when visitors come in, when people are new to church, really make a point to get to know them and find out if they have any needs because I'll tell you what, you may you bond with people when you help them out. I mean, I don't forget any of the people. We've had a lot of help in our move up here and a lot of other things. Even just, I mean, just in the course of my life, there's people who have helped me out and that means a lot to me personally. When someone comes and helps you out and they don't have to, but they just go out of their way and they make a point that, you know, I'm going to help this person out. That sticks with me probably a lot longer than it sticks with them. You know, when you do nice things for other people, a lot of times you don't even really think of it as a big deal. But other people, the people who are on the receiving end, it's a really big deal. And, and that's a good way to form bonds with people and, and just to get to know them and, and to love them as a brother or sister. Let's have that attitude in this church. And let's see what we can do for others. I mean, that's what we're here to do. We're here to minister. We're here to go out. We're going to try to reach people in, this, in the neighborhood, in the community, in our local area. We're going to try to reach them, and we're going to try to help them. We're going to try to bring them to Christ first and foremost and get them saved. And not only that, we're going to try. I mean, we want to see their growth and their benefit and, and, and what they can do for Christ. And, um, and let's try to have that spirit as a church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, um, I thank you much, so much for Word of Truth Baptist Church. God, I know we're going to do great things here. God, lead us and direct us. Help us to get our marching orders from you to go out and to, and to reach people. And I pray that you would please just guide us and help us to be a good influence on people and, and um, not to be selfish and have a, have a heart that's, that's greedy or covetous and that doesn't want to, to give things to, to help others. Dear Lord, help us not to have that type of an attitude, but rather to, to understand that it's more blessed to, to give than it is to receive and especially at this time of year, just help us to keep that in mind. And um, Lord, we love you, and, and I, I thank you so much for the book of Acts. God, it's such a great chapter. Help us have the boldness that we need to preach your word in the face of threatenings and adversity. And when the devil comes out and tries to attack us, dear Lord, and get us to, to stop preaching, God, I pray that you would please just fill us with, with more of your spirit and give us more boldness to come back. And, and just and not back down for a second and just and just continue to preach even even with more boldness, dear God. And I pray that for everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen.